I'm Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 23rd, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, now that we know the legislature will be closely divided, all eyes turn to the governor's budget. Second, the Alaska Municipal League says it's weighing in on state fiscal policy, and that may be a good thing for the PFD. And third, with the federal government proceeding to sell leases, we take a realistic look at the potential for ANWR development. And now, let's join Michael. Well, let's dive down into this. Yesterday, we had a chance to talk with Tammy Wilson, who's a former legislator, just to kind of get a feel and kind of her insight into what she, you know, what what the process would be right now, what she thinks is probably happening behind the scenes. You want to talk a little bit about legislative organization uh, as well, because it's going to obviously to get it's going to be the key to trying to bring Alaska's fiscal stuff back on track. Um, and uh, but you're saying that the 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 uh, organization may not be as important. Uh, as what the governor does uh, comes down to the governor's budget, right? Oh, I, I think I think it, the governor's budget is going to be critical, um, and it's not just me. Uh, Steve Thompson, in a um, in a Alaska Public Media uh, uh, article, I think Nat Hertz wrote it um, last week, uh, uh, came down to the no oh, Andrew Hitchman wrote it, came down to the same conclusion. Uh, he uh, Kitchman quoted uh, Thompson as saying. Uh, but Thompson said the shape of next year will be heavily affected by what Governor Mike Dunleavy proposes for the state budget next month. We're going to, this is Thompson, we're going to be waiting with bated breath for December 15th to get the governor's budget, he said. We're hoping that it'll be something he'll work with us on and with, and so it's going to be the deciding factor in how this session will probably go. And I, and I think that's a fair observation uh, by, by Thompson. If you, look at the, if you look at how the election has finally uh, uh, come out. If you look at the legislature, both on the Senate and on the House side, uh, it's fairly evenly split. Uh, frankly, I think Steve Thompson could be Speaker of the House. He may not be, but I think he could be Speaker of the House either as head of a Republican majority or as head uh, of a of a bipartisan caucus. Um, uh, and I think he's got a good. I think he's got a good feel for the for the uh, for the pulse of, of where the legislature is it's gonna they're they're looking to the governor for a signal uh and i think that signal is going to is going to set where the legislature both bodies uh, end up uh i'm i doubt that either one organizes frankly until uh the the governor uh, the governor's budget comes out if they do, it's probably because they're anticipating where the governor's budget is going to be, and that they're and they're responding uh, responding to it. Governor's budget could go one of two directions. It could either be his his 2019 budget, his first budget, right, which has uh, which had substantial cuts uh, and other maneuvers that uh, that that brought in revenues, uh, upstreamed revenues to the state. Didn't create net new revenues, but upstreamed revenues to the state. Um, and converted, uh, 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 we proposed to convert various uh, uh, investment accounts uh, over to uh, over to the general fund. It could be a repeat of that, um, or it could be a repeat of last year's budget, the twenty or earlier this year's budget, the twenty twenty budget, which uh, uh, was frankly uh, uh, not that different from what you might have expected from Bill Walker, uh, except 
except there weren't any revenues uh, on it. It was just sort of a spending as, as usual and and go along to get along budget. Um, it, it could be it, the governor could could signal either way. And I think I think there's a way to play the legislature, a way to deal with the legislature either way. As we've talked about on previous uh, uh, previous weeks, um, there is going to be a hardcore 16, a, a more hardcore 16 this time in the legislature, given uh, given some of the upsets that happened in the primary. Uh, there's going to be a hardcore 16 that I think would back the governor up on uh, on deep cuts. At least that's what they said during the campaign. That they were that they were running to support the governor and running to support a significantly reduced uh, uh, government footprint. So I think I think the governor could play it that way. Could come in with a with a with a fairly uh, uh, lower, dramatically lower budget, and have uh, 16 to back him up. Now, what that would do is is recreate a bi- bi- certainly recreate a bipartisan caucus in the in the House and. Uh, Likely recreate a uh, create a bipartisan caucus in the in the Senate, uh, and it would be a very contentious legisla- legislature. But the governor would have that 16 behind him, and I think would have uh, I think would have negotiating leverage to to accomplish, uh, frankly, quite a bit. The other way the governor could go is what he did earlier this year, and sort of go with a go along to get along budget, uh, not not propose deep spending cuts, not propose. Uh, uh, significant changes in uh, in in revenues, um, and and have and 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 likely have a supportive uh, or, or have a more supportive uh, legislative legislature uh, behind him. He'd probably lose the 16, but he'd have a more supportive uh, 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 legislature by uh, uh, support in in both bodies of doing that. The problem with that budget, the problem with that approach. Is 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 going to is going to require revenues, new revenues to uh, uh, to to balance the budget now that we've drained savings, uh, and so going that direction, the governor is going to have to confront revenues. Now he'll likely have uh, somewhat a somewhat supportive legislature behind him in in raising those revenues, uh, but that's where he's going to have to go if he if he goes in that direction. So I, th- I think Thompson's right. I think I think. What what's happened in this legislative cycle is is where the governor is strong in the valley and in uh, and in the Kenai uh, and elsewhere he's gotten North Pole he's gotten stronger he's gotten uh, stronger support uh, where the governor's weak uh, uh, he hasn't gained any strength um, uh, and so the 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 the, the net net result is he's going to have to make a decision which way he <laughs> wants to go. And it's going to and it's going to drive the legislature legislature from there. So what you're saying is, wait, we become even more polarized. The people who loved him love him even more, and the people that hated him hated him even more. I mean, that's I mean, that's kind of isn't that a dichotomy of uh, or isn't that a kind of a, a, a microcosm of what's going on in the uh, in the country as a whole right now? I mean, well, I, I, I think to a large ext- I think to a large extent that's right. I mean, he's got he's got a stronger 16 coming out of this legislative cycle or legislative races he's got a stronger 16 uh to back him up if that's if that's if that's the decision he makes um it, that will trigger uh uh his opposition the the recall will will revive again uh he'll have legislative he'll have bipartisan legislative majorities working against him it'll be a contentious situation but but he will have as, as we've talked about in previous programs i think he'll have Increase leverage in that in that those sixteen will back him up. Um, yeah, that that is that does create a a more polarized uh, situation. Uh, but to get to a less polarized situation, the governor is going to have to come up with revenues. And frankly, those same sixteen that he has backing him up, if he wants to make deep cuts, will become his biggest opponents um, uh, in in opposing those new revenues. So it's I mean. The governor ran to be governor, right? And 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 he is the governor, and he's now going to have to. He's got he's got substantial power coming into this legislature. Um, one side he has to rely on a minority, but he's got that minority there. I think you know, looking at the head count, I think he's got that minority there with him. Uh, he's going to have to make a decision, and and that decision will polarize one way or the other. But you know, that's what decisions do sometimes. Well, let me ask a question. I mean, you know, you say he he has these two options. He could go with the 2019 route or he could go, you know, to, you know, kind of the Bill Walker 2020 route. 
But really, is the 2020 option even even an even an option at this point? I mean, I mean, is it really? I mean, is it is that really feasible? We'll just continue. Okay, well, we'll just continue on. I mean, there's no money left. We would have to draw out of the ERA. We would have to do. I mean, is there is that really even an option moving forward with the with the financial situation of the state of Alaska? It is. It is. If uh, if he if he will acquiesce, if he's prepared to acquiesce in new revenues. I mean, it, it eliminates the PFD basically. I mean, because you, you're going to have a legislature that doesn't want to pass substitute taxes, uh, alternative taxes. And so it's going to end up with, you know, substantial cuts, if not the elimination of the, uh, of the PFD. But that's, I mean, that's, that's where, that's where that, that, that road uh, uh, goes. It goes down the road where you don't cut spending much. Uh, He's not going to be able to upstream revenues uh, because he's not going to have the support of the legislature to change the, change the law on uh, on uh, property all property taxes uh he's he's not going to be able to drain pce um so the revenues aren't going to come uh, aren't going to come from that direction uh they're going to have to come from someplace and either he's going to uh, support new taxes or uh he's going to end up supporting pft cuts because that's the only place that revenues are going to have to co- are going to have to come from it's not going to be it's not going to be what he ran on uh <laughs> But but it will it, it is it is one option available to him, and 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 the less contentious option available to him because the legislature will be you know legislature shown that they're perfectly happy to keep cutting cutting PFT. So yeah, it's an option, but it's a it's an option that will be uh, it's an option that he that he took in 2020 basically, and it's an option that uh, that will be different from what he ran on, but but it's one out there that. Uh, that there there will be support for in the legislature. I'm just going back here to see if there's anything interesting. Uh, I mean, the only choice is to try and balance the budget is tax and confiscate shareholder money. Uh, that, and that's really what it comes down to. We're going to tax and confiscate the shareholder money. Uh, I always thought a free market and great economy with everyone having a job and a chance of success was the answer. But that's not what happens when you... Uh, it's not what happens when you get a bunch of politicians together. They they look at the biggest, juiciest pot of money in the room and say, hmm, we could do better with that than you could. Uh, and that's kind of where we're at, right, Brad? I mean, this is the this is the idea of uh, – this is years of misspending and, ma- uh, you know, malappropriation and malinvestment uh, on the half on the, uh, on the part of the legislature. And they are just – you know, if, if they refuse to, to acknowledge it, they're just going to basically exacerbate the situation. Yeah, exactly right. And and this election essentially returned a legislative body. When you look at the House, the results in the House, I mean, Lance Pruitt's defeat and other things, this 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 election basically returned a legislature that uh, that is on balance more more prone to just keep on keeping on with what they what they've been doing. Uh, I mean, it, it, your your comment about we're even more split is is is, is a is a good insight. Because basically those areas that are Republican, very conservative, got more conservative. You kicked out Jennifer Johnson, you got James Kaufman. You kicked out Kathy Giesel, you got Roger Holland. You kicked out uh, uh, Chuck Kopp, uh, and you got Tom McKay. You kicked out John Coghill, and you got Rob Myers. They became more conservative. Um, but but areas that were purplish uh, uh, became more blue. Uh, you kicked out uh, Lance Pruitt. Uh, you got Liz Snyder. Um, so you've got you, you've got um, you, you've got a, a, a definite split uh, in the state. I, I guess my point is you've got enough conservatives, you got enough rock rib conservatives uh, that they can back Governor Dunleavy up if he goes down the goes down the the spending cut uh, uh, piece of it, uh, the spending cut trail. Uh, but by and large, you by and large, if you look at the majority, the legislature that got elected uh, is more purplish than not. Um, I mean, Steve Steve Thompson will say that he's a conservative, but but at the right. end, he's, he's perfectly ready right. to cut the PFD. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, and kicked out Mel Gillis, right? I mean, exactly. So we saw a lot of these things go on. It's going to be interesting to see how this whole thing plays out. Give us a tease for uh, for the second uh, of the weekly top three, which is the AML, which is probably something that most Alaskans are not familiar with. Maybe they've heard it in passing, but they don't really know what they what it is. 
Um, uh, give us a give us a, a, a tease of what's coming up on part two here. The Alaska Municipal League is composed of the uh, various towns and boroughs. Um, uh, most of the towns and boroughs uh, in the state. It's a it's a group that focuses mostly on local issues, um, local government issues. But as as part of their winter session that they just finished, uh, or fall session, uh, whichever it was, they formed a fiscal policy working group uh, that set out some some fairly specific positions uh, on uh, on state policy. Uh, and and is proposing, I think, to become active at the state level in pushing those fiscal policy positions. Um, and, and frankly, I think there's some good news in there. Um, so uh, the second segment is going to be focused on what uh, on, on AML's fiscal policy working group and what their what their position is. The AML, which doesn't sound very insidious, but I'll be honest with you, uh, after having been part of it, after having attended their briefings, after having been a part of a of, of a of an assembly and seeing the sway that they have on policies around the state of Alaska, that's an organization that uh, kind of worries me. I'll be honest with you. Well, it's 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 worrisome, but it's also I think it's beneficial, and I'll and I'll talk about that here in just a second. But the AML has forced has, has formed uh, a fiscal policy working group uh, that's uh, comprised of Bryce Ward, who's the Mayor of the Fairbanks uh, North Star Borough, Clay Walker, who's the mayor of the Denali Borough, Paul Ostrander, who's the mayor, who's the manager of the city of Kenai, Jordan Keeler, manager of the city of Sandpoint, and Jeff Rogers, who's the finance director of the city and borough of uh, of Juneau. That core group uh, is going to work on uh, on fiscal policy issues, state level fiscal policy issues. Obviously, the the local governments become very interested. In, uh, in state level fiscal policy because one of the ways for the state to respond to the current fiscal situation is to push down responsibility and 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 as a result cost for a lot of services down to local government in expanding uh, the, uh, the 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 role of local government but also the uh, the cost of local government uh, and 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 the burden that, that that local governments have to pass on to their uh, to their uh, uh, taxpayers, um, and so AML's formed this fiscal policy group uh, to address uh, state level issues, and 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 they came out yesterday, and and I would highly recommend this to anybody who really wants to keep up with this stuff. It's on the the AML website, which is akml.org. Uh, they 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 announced the launch of their fiscal policy working group, um, and they had a list of bullet points uh, that uh, that. That are going to be sort of their drivers in um, in the positions they're going to take, and and it's some stuff that you would that you would imagine. The first one, for example, is further budget reductions are inadvisable without an appropriate plan, timeline, and resourcing in place for those services to be effectively and efficiently delivered by others. Unallocated reductions uh, in spending are irresponsible and should be avoided. Um, and and other things that you would expect local governments. Uh, uh, to push for, you know, keep the burden up at the state level. Don't don't push it down to us. Uh, you guys address it, uh, and don't cut any services because then the demand for services at our our level is going to be uh, uh, greater. But here's the one, here's the one that I that I focused on that caught my eye most. A plan must be developed for sustainable use of permanent fund earnings. And this next phrase is the key phrase with equal equal consideration of community needs and individual dividend payments. That's the first <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. That, that's the first time I have seen um, uh, AML uh, uh, or any municipal governments step out and, and, and say that equal consideration must be given to individual dividend payments. And I think that's a very good sign. I think I think that's a sign that local governments recognize the importance of the dividend uh, to the members of their community, uh, and they're stepping up to uh, to say that's an important consideration to them. And having that voice in the uh, on that issue uh, involved in the discussion in the legislature, I think could be uh, could be very helpful. Well, and I think we need to address the individual impact, and that's something that I mean, you and I have talked about for years of the ISA report and everything else. 
that the largest impact uh, on Alaska families is with the taking of that. I mean, it is refreshing to see that. What makes me nervous again is that they want to put it on equal footing. I mean, first and foremost, the fact that this is even in discussion is irritating to me. And I know that you will say, well, they're already taking it. But the fact that they're saying, oh, we're going to put it on equal footing with, you know, the, the common good versus the individual. Anytime that I look at the common good versus the individual, the common good is always a code for we're going to take it from you and spend it for you because we know better than you how to take care of it. Yeah, I understand that, Michael. But we have to we have to go back to Governor Hammond's view, vision, right? The vision was 50-50. 50 50 percent for state government, fifty percent for uh, for dividends. I mean, even going back to Governor Hammond, we had a split of the permanent fund earnings uh, between uh, between individuals and, uh, and 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 state government. So I think I think this equal con- I think the term equal consideration is consistent with. It is no more than consistent with the Hammond view. I don't think it's I, – I, I don't interpret it, at least at this point, as saying that, oh, we're going to we're gonna grab more of it. I mean, the, the use of the word equal, I think, uh, I think picks up on Governor Hammond's view. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, the Alaska Municipal League has – I mean, it's good, at least, that we're going to be discussing this and that we probably should – I guess the uh, the the question is, and and let's going back. I, I like to dig into the uh, I like to dig into the motivations of different organizations. As I said, I've been concerned about AML for quite some time because they're an organization that is not <clears throat> that is not. Uh, uh, I mean, it's dedicated to really furthering themselves and growing municipal municipalities. That's really what they're about. And that's not always, again, mutually exclusive with the uh, idea that individuals should be protected as much as the, you know, municipal power and things like that. Right. I, I, yes, I, I will agree that AML is uh, is is focused on protecting uh, government services at the local level, and and they they view their role as protecting that and enhancing that, uh, and you know, and and that's. That's a it's a pro government organization uh, in in that sense, but e, but but I think then it's even more even more useful that in 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 that role of of looking out for local government, looking out for local government services, that they're recognizing that the dividend needs to have equal consideration uh, with uh, with community needs a split. Uh, that recognizes equal consideration to uh, to, to the individual individual dividend. There aren't too many organizations, frankly, um, and particularly government organizations, that are out there pushing for a recognition of the importance of the dividend. Not even the Matsu Burrow, right? Frankly, uh, uh, does a lot to push for uh, uh, push for the dividend. It's more, you know, we we need money. We need to raise money. Um, and we need the state, you know, to continue to provide these services, so we don't have to. We don't have to raise additional money to do that. Uh, for AML to be stepping out there and talking about, even talking about the dividend, much less pushing for equal consideration of the dividend, I think, I think is a very positive, uh, positive step. Particularly given the role you just outlined. Particularly right. given their role in the past of having uh, looked out for, <clears throat> to some degree, bigger local government. We got about two and a half minutes here for the number three, which is talking about Anwar. Can you give us a summation real quick? Yep, uh, there is a really good uh, piece by uh, uh, an oil industry analyst that I've long respected, a guy by the name of Phil Verlager, who is um, uh, uh, a longtime uh, industry analyst, professor, uh, academic. Uh, but also does a lot of consulting work, and I think really has a good feel for how the industry operates. He's 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 not the most popular person in the industry uh, because sometimes he's a little direct uh, uh, in his in his opinions. But I think really has great insights uh, into the industry. He wrote a piece um, uh, on uh, on the Niskanen Center uh, website, N I S K A N E N Center. Uh, dot org for those who are trying to follow up. Uh, his name is Phil Verlager. The title of the piece is "Anwar is Safe," um, and <laughs> it's not it's not uh, in the sense of uh, in the sense of it's safe going to be safe for the oil industry. Basically, he's saying uh, to all of those 
uh, rabid environmentalists, uh, don't worry, Anwar is going to be safe. And, and, and Berlager goes through then and outlines why, from an economic standpoint, right. uh, it's, it's not going <clears> to <throat> yep. make much sense for, uh, uh, for oil companies to be, uh, to be bidding uh, on Anwar. An important piece, important analysis. I highly recommend it for people to read. So give us the too long, don't read version of the Anwar is safe commentary, Brad. Uh, what's, the, you know, what's, the, what's the rundown here? Well, the rundown is that uh, the the cost uh, and the and the uh, the uncertainty of Anwar that is you, you may get the lease but you may not be able to develop it uh, is likely going to put Anwar out of reach uh, for uh, for any significant bidding. Uh, essentially, he's saying no major oil company is going to come up here uh, and uh, and and bid on Anwar, um, and and no bank is going to finance uh, a company coming up here. The uh, a smaller company coming up here. It's just, it's just not going to be, it's just not a good investment. It's a highly speculative uh, investment that, that, lo- that has a very low probability of playing out uh, over, over the long term. And while I don't want to overstate it, um, I think, I think this piece uh, does a good job of, of laying out why Alaska uh, is, 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 you know, it's a good overview of where we may be headed from an Alaska perspective on additional industry investment. We've got Willow, uh, and, uh, and Conoco appears uh, intent on following through Willow. Uh, but Pika, uh, which is the oil search prospect, the old Armstrong prospect, and now uh, headed by oil search, uh, attracting the, the investment that's going to be required to develop Pika, maybe. Uh, but but we're really we're, we're we're sort of running to the to the out of uh, opportunities. I think where Alaska uh, oil is going to be uh, additional development, and for and for people who want to understand why that is, uh, I think verlegger has got a got a great summary there. Just too risky, too much money, uh, uh, too uh, uh, too much potential for the federal government to uh, to interrupt development activities. Uh, and um, and and there's better oil, cheaper oil, easier to produce oil uh, elsewhere. Not to mention political blowback, obviously, uh, as we're seeing with the banks and everything else in the in the Arctic and the uh, all the political machinations of the environmentalists on top of everything. Yeah, and it's and 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 Verlager, Verlager has a comment in here that I think is important. He said, you know, ten, twenty years ago, ten years, ten years ago, even five years ago. Uh, Anwar, we might have seen a rush of, of of interest in Anwar, but the the world has evolved in a way since, with shale, the development of shale, uh, and 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 frankly, the ease of developing incremental oil supplies out of shale, uh, with the with the focus on on climate uh, issues, with the banks backing off, with the high risk of uh, of administrations just going back and federal administrations going back and forth. Uh, between those that are supportive, but then succeeded by those who aren't aren't supportive, uh, he said, you know, 10, 15, 10, five years, even five years ago, Anwar might have been uh, might have been a really uh, a, a, a really great opening, a really great opportunity. He said, but but the the, the it's past its time. Uh, uh, things have moved on. Oil's been has become uh, uh, available elsewhere. Demand is declining. Uh, risk has gone up, and it's just really uh, uh, we've, we've, the, the window of opportunity is closed. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, I hope you uh, I hope you have a good uh, holiday, and I hope uh, you uh, all your teams win and all that stuff. I hope everything goes well for you, and uh, I hope you get a little restorative time there in your relaxation of being, uh, you know, <laughs> of being uh, 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 retired when you're not retired. You know <laughs> what I mean? So well. Michael, I hope you and Terry have a great Thanksgiving as well, and I hope uh, I hope uh, your arteries don't harden too much. Ah, uh, it's a once a year thing, luckily. So we'll do until we come to Christmas, and then we do my my father's brown sugar brown sugar and bourbon ham, uh, basted all full bone in ham. I'll have to tell you all about that later on. It's uh, it's amazing. So I'm going to have to add another egg to the omelet. There yeah, you go. There you go. All right. Thank you so much, Brad. Appreciate you coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Uh, all right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for uh, Sustainable Budgets uh, here on the big radio program. Well, 
That's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.